Greetings to one and all here from the Holy Apple in the Holy Land. We are on the 17th day of the month of Adar. Hope everybody had a meaningful Purim 5777. <clears throat> the title today of our class will be The Destruction in Ofra warning graphic about two weeks ago in a town which is about uh, a five minute drive from Amona there's another town called Ofra now Ofra is one of the is one of the strongholds of the of religious uh, Zionism you know of the flag of the national anthem of law abiding a state abiding you know they're like the symbol of <clears throat> the national religious camp so they're Two weeks ago, nine houses were on the slate to be destroyed, and nine houses eventually were destroyed. So, <clears throat> it's important that we discuss exactly what happened and understand what our, what we could take, what we could learn from this tragedy and disaster one more time. Okay, first I'm going to start with my own personal story, because my own personal story is probably a story which is similar to other people's stories, and it kind of says a lot about our situation today. Okay, so um, I get a call, I get a call in, in the morning from a friend of mine that I learned with in the Yeshiva Elon Moreh, I get a call that it's, uh, it's worthwhile to come down because it looks like the forces of evil are going to come to destroy these houses. So for a long time, maybe a half hour, I was deliberating, going both ways, back and forth. What was the proper thing to do? In the morning hours, I, have, I teach small kids ages 3 to 6, I teach them Torah, Judaism, and uh, it's not a very simple, it's not a very simple thing just to say that, uh, okay, today you're not going to learn. It's a, it's a tremendous responsibility and a heavy yoke over a person to teach these kids. And uh, it says in the uh, Jewish law that even to build the temple, the children should not be um, taken out of their learning classes. Even to build the temple, which is a commandment, which is a positive commandment, we don't take the kids out of their learning. I mean, if they're learning, you know, math or something, you take them out. But talking about the Judaism, Torah subjects. So I was going back and forth. I decided that it was more important for me to teach. I taught my classes. And uh, somewhere about 11 o'clock when I finished, I called up another friend of mine and I asked, him if, I asked him if it was worthwhile to come down and he said, yeah, come on down. So, jumped in the car and headed on down. So I'm coming into the entrance of Ofra like a take two Hollywood, uh, you know, scene. I've been there, done that before in Amona. I get to the gate and lo and behold, of course, the gate is... Uh, uh, is there's police and army personnel all over there and they stop me and they say where are you going are you a resident of Ofra I said no but uh, I have to uh, I have a meeting here in Ofra and they said well we're sorry you we can't let you in okay so take two been there done that I parked the car it's like a rerun over here and not only that I take my backpack and I start walking along the fence, also the fence of Ofra, take two from the Amona destruction. 
and I'm walking this time something a little bit different this time uh, I see on the other side of the gate on the inside of Ofra I'm on the outside I see a lot of soldiers unlike last time where there were maybe about four or five soldiers that were patrolling the area of the fence to make sure that nobody would sneak in so this time there were a lot of soldiers not only that this time they also began to speak they said excuse me hello uh, stop please and let me tell you a lesson I learned very well in the army I was taught very early in my uh, when I entered the army somebody gave me a great piece of information the information was that if you ever get a pass from the army to leave the base never look back even if you hear your name being called someone saying hey you do not look back why because we see what happened to the wife of Lot when the city of Sodom Saddam was destroyed so the wife of Lot looked back what happened to her she turned into a pillar of salt so somebody told me on an army base listen whenever you get this this pass a ticket to leave the base never look back because it might be somebody calling you back they want to bring you back maybe you have to stay in maybe they need more manpower do not look back and leave as fast as you can do not look back okay so I ain't looking back so they're yelling at me calling me hey give it bo you know they're calling me out and I'm just walking 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 and they're like walking I see them walking with me just on the opposite side of the fence now fortunately I know the ropes and I know that there's only a certain amount of I, I know that there's only a certain amount of territory that they are allowed to uh, you know to go they have a limit they just can't keep on walking for two kilometers following me there's a limit they have their uh, district and they have to stay within that region they have to stay within the region so I figure that I walk you know I'll keep on walking and then they'll have to stop and thank God that's what happened they had to stop and I saw that they went back to where they came from in the meantime I'm walking around the fence and thank God I find a nice size hole in the fence and I fly into the fence okay now there's a road and there's rocks and there's thorns and of course the best way to the best path is to go into the rocks and the thorns which will make it harder if there's any army jeeps or half tracks that come to try to uh, find people that are sneaking in they're going to have a much more difficult time or an impossible time to try to get me once I'm in the you know the mountains and the rocks and the thorns and the bushes they're not going to really have too much of a chance if I'm on a road they could just pick me off and arrest me so anyways that's what I did uh, I'm not sure where I'm going here so I asked somebody when I finally saw a person I asked somebody told me the general direction and you know I see tons of soldiers hundreds of soldiers around I'm just walking I'm not saying anything in the meantime so far so good no one stopped me believe it or not I find myself after I got out of the car maybe a half hour later I find myself approximately 200 meters away from the houses that are slated to be destroyed in the land of Israel 200 meters away pretty close I noticed that the the <clears throat> there's a group of people that are beginning to gather together outside one of the houses and they're trying to gather a quorum to to pray the afternoon prayers so I'm walking and I get about 200 meters and all of a sudden a group of uh, soldiers from the border patrol stop me and they say where are you going I said well I just wanted to pray the afternoon service if that's okay no it's not okay I said what's the problem I just let me go there and that's it you know just let me go there and pray no you can't go I said listen I want to speak to the commander here in charge 
So they bring the commander, you know, he's something like 40, 50 years old, this guy. And I tell him, listen, I, I want to pray the afternoon service. I didn't, cause, I didn't come here to cause any trouble. Just allow me to go and pray. No, you can't go. You're bothering us. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't leave here, we'll have to arrest you. I said, I'm not bothering you. I'm not bothering you. And I'm staying here. And if you don't let me pray 200 meters down the road, so I'm just going to pray right over here. So the commander, commanding officer leaves. About two minutes later, a soldier comes up to me and he whispers something in my ear. I said, what? He says, listen, I'm going to tell you how to get in. I'm going to tell you how to get in. So you see, even in a, even in a place where there's these wicked people that are about to destroy Jewish homes, you'll find at least one or two righteous people. So a soldier comes out to me, whispers in my ear, he tells me exactly the best strategy. He knows where the soldiers are located. He's one of them. And he's telling me exactly, go right here, left, straight, backwards, and you're in. So I listened attentively to what he was saying, attentively what he was saying, and he was right. And I found myself about 10 minutes later, right into the right into the zone so once again I'm just gonna say this important lesson for all of us this important lesson for all of us that the forces of evil in this case the army and the police you know they're they're out there but if you have self-sacrifice if you're stubborn you'll be victorious. And that's why the Gra writes that Akshan Matzliach, that if you're stubborn, you'll be successful in learning Torah and in worshiping God. If you're stubborn. Because these people, you know, they're accustomed, what's, I, I, I saw very clearly that they set up a, they set up like a security ring or many rings and they believe, and they're correct, unfortunately, that most people, when they hear that the army is closed down and the police have closed down roads, and when they hear that there are, uh, there are rings of soldiers around communities, they know that 90-some percent of the people will give up and will not even try. So, this is their... This is their this is their belief, and unfortunately, in most situations, they are correct. Most people, they just turn on their radios, they hear that the road or two have been closed, and the place is surrounded by army and police personnel, and that's enough for them. You know, what do you want from me? I couldn't go, I wanted to go, but I heard on the news, this is not an excuse. This is not an excuse. This, there, I, I, <clears throat> there are so many cases we just could go over one after another after another just the names of the places change but the same idea if you have sacrifice if you're willing to spend time you will succeed in getting through the lines of the army and the police you will succeed so that's an important lesson don't give up okay so to understand the situation in Ofra, there are nine houses that are slated to be destroyed. Okay, now we're talking about like smack in the middle of Ofra, like you can't believe it. It's not like you're in Amona. Amona was a <coughs> was a a area. It was the whole area was destroyed. The streets and the electricity, and the homes, everything was destroyed, but it was like one community. Here, you're in the middle of like a small city, Ofra, and you have like in the middle one row of nine houses that are slated to be destroyed. Like, like you're in the middle of a town. It's, it's like one of you, <laughs> imagine like, you live in LA, and like on one block in Los Angeles, they're going to take down eight houses. I mean, that's pretty wild. So, 
Unfortunately, eight out of the nine families that live or lived, unfortunately in the past tense, in Ofra, they already surrendered. They were not, uh, they were not even going to put up a protest. They already had a written an agreement with the uh, establishment, with the government, that they would not protest, they would not, uh, you know, fight, they would not, um, they would not uh, go against the uh, decision of the government and the high court. So here we're in a real bad situation. We have eight that already there's no one to talk to. There's only one family. There's only one family. I'm not going to say their name. As we get further in the story, you'll understand why I'm not going to say their name, even though you should say, and rightfully so, that it seems like this, there's one family that was willing to stand up and allow people to come to their homes to protest against the expulsion in Ofra. So, but I'm, you'll see at the, at, as the story develops, you'll understand why I'm not mentioning his name. I don't want to speak right now. There's no a benefit of me saying his name, and later on I'll have to speak derogatory. <clears throat> okay, so there's one family in Ofra that opened up their, their home. They have a two-story house that's slated to be destroyed, house number nine, and they allowed... Uh, whoever wanted to come to protest against the expulsion, they uh, opened up their doors. So, believe it or not, there's approximately 300 people or so in the homes. There's another probably 50 people on the roof of the house. Two stories, pretty high up. Now, <clears throat> some hours later, okay, this is about, uh, we're talking here about 12 o'clock, 12.30 uh, p.m., and approximately four hours later, approximately four hours later, the forces of evil have come. And uh, just a few things before we get to the actual, <coughs> the actual fight that took place inside. That's important to, to understand here. I mentioned that the people of Ofra, there are many settlements in Judea and Samaria, Yudan Shomron. And most of them, most of them, unfortunately, are not very activist mindset. They're not from the activist family, or the fighting families, not at all. There are a handful of places. This is true not just from today, this has always been true. If you look in Gush Katif, who came down to fight? against the expulsion of Jews from the Gaza Strip area. If you look back 30 years to the expulsion of Jews in the Sinai Desert in the times of Begin, if you look which communities came down, left their homes, the comforts of their homes, and sacrificed and spent a week, two, a month, two, three months away from home in difficult conditions, we'll see that they're from the same nucleus of a handful of settlements. They're places like Kiryat Arba, places like Hebron, Yitzhar, Elon More, Itamar, Tapuach. These are places which are year in and year out you, have, you will have a nice um, turnout from these communities which, that are coming out to fight against the various expulsions. So Ofra is part of the majority, the overwhelming majority, 90-something percent of communities that are not activists, that will not take a chance to be arrested. They might not be accepted in the army. That's the Holy of Holies, getting into the army. It's taken over the place of the temple. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, we have a community here, one of the 
earlier, one of the first settlements, and they're very state loyal people. You know, one of the apple pie kind of people, the flag, you know, on Independence Day, they have, you know, three or four flags outside to make sure that, uh, depending which way you come into their house, you won't think that, God forbid, they don't have a flag up. People that, you know, there's no question whether they should go into the army or not go into the army. There's no question by them, should the girls go to national service or not. No questions at all. It's just this robotic, that's the way it's been, probably the way it will stay. So listen to what they did. The people in Ofra made sure that in every single house, in every single house, there were at least one or two, uh, we'll call them plants. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about a plant that grows. We're not talking about, you know, plants. We're talking about the plants, you know, like people that are playing a double role. A double role. They are... They are residents of Ofra, but they've come to make sure that nothing, that the youth, which are most of the people that come for these things, that the youth will not do anything that they do not see fit. They do not see as correct. So you have these insiders here, undercover, so to speak, but they're not undercover. It's not like they're hiding it. There's these people in every home. And they're making sure they're telling people over and over again. I was there, once again, from 12.30 to 4.30. I saw people coming in and out, in and out. You know, I said anybody in Ofra that comes into this house over the age of 21, in my eyes, is a suspicious character. Anyone over the age of 21 can't be trusted. So they have these people that are coming in, they're going up to the roofs. They're not coming onto the roof to join the battle. They're onto the roofs in order to make sure that the people on the roofs understand the rules of game. Understand the rules of the game here. And to make sure that nobody will do anything to really fight against. It will just be a protest. It will be a protest, a nice protest. Hopefully people will cry and they'll sing a few good songs. As anyone remembers Gush Katif, there are certain songs that I cannot sing any longer. After Gush Katif, when they were being thrown out and destroyed, their families were being destroyed and their lives were being destroyed and their homes being destroyed. There are certain songs which I'm not even gonna sing because I can't sing them anymore. You know, that was the, you felt like you were the, at, the, at the Boy Scouts. It was like an event of the Boy or the Girl Scout event. Or B'nai Akiva event. But not what it really was. A destruction in the land of Israel. A desecration of God's name in the, in the land of Israel. Okay, so in our, in, on my floor, I was on the second floor. I was on the second floor of the house. I was like outside on one of these uh, on one of these balconies with about maybe another 50, 60 people. And there's a guy from Ofra. You know, he's in his whole uh, army outfit. He's in his whole army outfit. And he tells us the following. He says, guys, as soon as I see the army coming in and the police coming in, okay, I have the key here. See the key? I'm going to lock this door, and I'm going to cut the blinds. There's a string that attaches us to the blinds, up and down. I'm going to cut it, so they're going to have a real tough time getting into... Excuse me. I must be allergic to the story. So, Okay, so he says, I have the key, I'm going to close the door, it's going to be very difficult. I think, he's in a culture, I think you're in a culture shock here. This is all like, uh, <laughs> he's coming from uh, Costa Rica, <laughs> thinking he wants to like help, you know, the, the army and that, but everything. <laughs> like, no, it's hard to understand how everything yeah. fits in. That's like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Okay, so... 
this guy, right, he's telling us, this, 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 this guy in uniform, in an army uniform, he's telling us, okay. So, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, Boy, this guy, he's the plant. He's the insider here. This guy, you know, he's, he's 30 something years old. He's the plant. He's the insider. I don't believe one word that he's saying. I don't believe one word that he's saying. So, uh, 4.30 comes along. 4.30 comes along. And the forces of evil have arrived. Yes, they have arrived. And this man with the uniform, he closes the door and he, he shuts the blinds and somebody says, don't forget to cut them, don't forget to cut the string so they can't, so the blinds will just stay there, they won't be able to pick them up, it's hard to pick them up, they're pretty heavy. Folks, you know, but you say hocus pocus, about the same guy that locks the door right and gave us the speech well right now believe it or not there's a knock at the door to our balcony and sure enough he opens the door and look who's there and also gives a hug can't forget that hug you know you know he, rem he recognizes somebody there can't forget that hug. So, like, you know, we have these teenagers, most 99% of the people are teenagers, they're like, their mouths are open, like, oh, what? You just open the door, whatever, whatever, so I'm gonna close the door, and I'm gonna get rid of the key, I'm gonna throw it over the bo overboard here, and I'm gonna cut the string of the blinds. They're just like, what? Eh. Expect it. I expected 100%. Okay, so now, now they're inside, now they're on the balcony with us here. They're on the balcony with us. Okay, now, I see, not only one guy on our floor, but now come in two or three other representatives of the settlement of Ofra. And they're telling us, Listen, don't forget, don't throw bottles, don't throw water, don't lift up your hands. You know, we're just here to, to protest and nothing more. Like, how did you guys get in here? Like, did you come with the forces? Yeah, they came in with the forces. Everything here that's going down is a joint effort. It's a joint effort by the leaders, so-called leaders of Ofra, the army, and the police. It's everything is joint. Okay. So, uh, the, one of the head officers comes and says, uh, if you don't leave, we're going to have to use force and, and take you out. Okay. No. <clears throat> one guy gets up. And, uh, it, and one guy gets up, and because somebody told him that his wife is downstairs, and his wife asked if he came if not to stay in there when they're coming to uh, take people out. She's uh, asking, and he got up and left us. Okay, but everybody else, uh, so to speak, stayed. Okay, so <clears throat> with my merit, quote-unquote, I had the luck to be one of the first people that they, they're going after, you know. Now, <clears throat> I'm not the typical person that you expect there because all these kids could be my kids. I mean, I have kids that are even younger than they are. So, I'm not the usual character here. So, of course, this is a real, you know, this is a real, pot, a real slap in the face to me. I noticed recently, also in Amona, they'll come up to me and say, listen, you know, you're not a kid. You know, you're not a kid. And, uh, you know, we really don't want to have to deal with you. We, we've come to deal with kids, you know, but we really, it's not, it's not pleasant for us to have to, you know, to go after you and to, to pick you up and to drag you and, uh, and get involved. So can you please just leave? 
So this is a real slap in the face for me, you know, because it, 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 I'm the last person that they should tell this to. But uh, what, what can you do? You know, it comes with the age, you know, it comes with the age. And that's what they... So I'm the first guy, you know. So <clears throat> I have a... Okay, I have a policy that I do not, uh, you know, say, I do not, not only don't I recognize their authority, but I also do not speak to them. I don't engage in, in conversation with them. No connection whatsoever, which we'll get to later on. <clears throat> okay, so they come. I'm holding on a friend of mine from the Shiva Nelon More. Uh, a friend of mine is, is with me. We're holding on tight, really, really tight, and they come by and they're not able to separate us. There's like four guys trying, four police, army personnel that are trying to get us out. They're not successful. And I'll never forget this guy's face. Never in a million years forget this face. So they're not, we have four guys trying to get, they're not succeeding here. And I'll never forget it. Hold on, hold on, don't forget. <laughs> now we're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm never going to forget that face. This tall, <clears throat> this tall uh, police riot officer, to tell by the clothes that he was wearing. So this is not regular police. This is not army. This is not border police. This is the what's called in Hebrew the Yasam what we call the Samech Men, which is one of the forces of evil according to Kabbalah. So it's the same letters, the Samech Men. So this guy, tall guy, big guy, never forget his face. There are four people, you know, they're trying to get us, trying to get me and my friend out, they're not successful. And he comes by. He comes from the side, I see him, he comes from the side. And he takes out, he takes out some knuckles of his, takes out these, takes out his two knuckles over here, and on purpose, to hurt. You know, you have these four, four riot police on me, okay, fair and square. This guy comes from the side. And he takes his two knuckles and he starts okay. digging into my hands okay. at okay. full, you know, full strength. And Hi, I don't know if I'm like yelling at the top of my lungs because it's really, it's really, you know, it's like killing my hands. He's just like digging these knuckles and he's smiling. Never forget his face. May his memory be erased. He's smiling. I see him right now as I'm giving this class, even though it was about two weeks ago. I see him right there. And I would know, I would recognize him on the street too. And he's there. And he's just, two of these knuckles, just like, you know, just digging it into, into, into my hand. You know, I'm, I got my mom's hands, you know, my mom has like no... My mom's very weak in her hands and, and her uh, wrists, you know. I'm from that family. It's like, not a, it's not an easy zone for us. And I just, I just, you know, and I, I'm yelling and he's on purpose and, he, and he's smiling as he's doing it. And I just, you know, I just said to him, you know, that he is cursed. I didn't say any curse words. I, <clears throat> I just said that, that I will curse him, okay, that he will know, that he will not be a, a, around too much longer. He will not be around too much longer. Folks, I kid you not. So I'm yelling, you know, top of my lungs because it's killing me, this guy, and it keeps on going. And this guy comes up to me. This guy comes up to me. I still, I'm still, they haven't gotten me up yet. This guy comes up to me and he says, listen. You don't know who I am, but this is my house. Yeah, this is my house. And we have rules here, he tells me. We have rules here. What you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And you've just broken a few of those rules. We don't curse anybody here and we don't lift up hands. 
Now, I cannot believe it. Who is this clown? This, I mean, I can't even believe this is happening. I said you have the chutzpah, the gall, to come up to me? You're coming up to me? I have four, four riot police, a fifth guy coming from the side. He's just getting into the... He's causing me an unbelievable amount of pain on my hands. And you come to me? You tell me about your rules? You got the wrong guy! Anyways, that's why I didn't mention the one person, the one family that opened their homes to allow the youth to come to protest. This is the best of them. The best. Coming up to me. You know, I have blood all over me. It's coming up to me. I'm the problem here. Unbelievable. Coming up to me. Anyways, it gets worse. Eventually, they're able to get me up. And then, also never forget, in order to shame me, once they have me out of the building, outside, there's reporters, there's people, on purpose, one of the five riot police that are holding me pulls down my pants you heard it right you heard it right go back and you can listen to it again on purpose just to shame a person there's no there's no strategic there's no I'm, I'm already I'm outside I'm you know I'm about two minutes away from dragging me into the buses and on purpose guy I see him in front of me pulls down you know pulls down my pants eventually they're successful to get us on buses the buses take us for a two-hour ride and dump us off from Ofra. They take us from Ofra, which is in the Benjamin area near the Shomron. They dump us off in a shopping center in Beit Shemesh, two hours from Ofra. Now, understand this. Not everybody has money. Not everybody has a backpack. Not everybody has a sweater. And they throw us off the bus in the middle of Beit Shemesh. Goodbye. There is no, there is no bus from the municipality of Ofra to bring us back. We're just stuck. We're stuck out in Beit Shemesh. So thank God, thank God, I've been at these things many times, so I always know to take some money for these types of situations. So thank God I had some money, because I had to pay for five guys that were with me on the bus that didn't have any money. So eventually, we made our way, we took a bus back to Jerusalem from Beit Shemesh, from Beit Shemesh, from Jerusalem, we took a bus to Ofra, and <clears throat> Ofra, I got back into my car, which was parked there for the whole day, and eventually got home at, uh, you know, <clears throat> towards 12 o'clock, 12 a.m., so... <clears throat> I wanted to read, I wanted to take this opportunity to read two, two pieces of letters that my daughter copied for me from the bulletin board of her high school. My daughter who was also in 
Ofra. She was also in Amona a month ago, but also in Ofra two weeks ago. So she's in 10th grade. So she copied for me. I didn't know about this, these letters. She copied for me two letters that uh, two different girls had placed on the bulletin board of the school. And it's important to listen to the words. Listen to the words closely of these teenagers, of these holy teenagers. Our leaders have come out. I'm translating, of course, from Hebrew to English. I'll do the best that I can. Our leaders, of course, came out publicly and very very viciously against us even though they were not present at the expulsions they didn't know what was done to us or what really happened but that did not stop them from condemning us in the public media yes on one hand, there was some violence on our side against those that came to destroy these communities. However, that is null and void compared to the violence that was done against us by the soldiers and by the police. Yes, we could talk at some of the at some of the youth that threw various objects at the police. But I want to talk about something else, this teenager writes. I want to talk about the soldiers and police that threw chairs at the heads of youth that were just sitting down and protesting and did nothing. That's what I want to talk about. Those soldiers and the police that threw chairs at the heads of youths that just were sitting down and doing nothing. Yes, we could talk about various youths that were against allowing the leftist media to come in to various homes or the uh, synagogue to film what was happening. But I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the police who are supposed to be upholding the law, how they refused in order that the world and the people of Israel would not see the real story. So the police did not allow reporters in, even though this is against the law. Yes, we can speak, perhaps, about various people, a few that destroyed vehicles of the army and of the police that, have, that, had, that were, had come to destroy these communities. But let's talk about something else. Let's talk about all the police that, on purpose, destroyed the cell phones of the youth. Yes, there were a few minority of youth that did resort to violence when they came to de destroy the synagogue. But let's talk about let's talk about all the police and the soldiers that just beat them up totally even though by this time they were not doing anything but sitting down and protesting. I want to talk about those that were chained and could not move and five, five policemen kicking them also in their private parts even though they were not bothering anybody and they could not 
defend themselves as they were chained up. Yes, we could talk about a few police that were injured, but I want to talk to you about dozens of protesters that were not allowed to be taken off the buses to receive first aid. And I want to talk about the fact that cell phones were taken from the youths so they could not film what was going on so the world would not see. Yes, you, we, could, we, could, we could listen to the lies of the establishment, how, how some youth threw pepper spray at the forces that came to destroy. This was totally false. But they do not tell us what the police and the army, how they destroyed a synagogue in the land of Israel. I was there, writes this girl. I received tremendous amounts of punches. I know the truth. You cannot compare what was done on our side compared to what was done to us. There's no comparison, there's no proportion. Yes, you can call us hooligans, but that's also a big lie. Because you're dealing here with tremendous idealistic youth. Instead of hanging in, out in their schools or in their homes playing computer games, or instead of going out for dinner or for some ice cream, they decided to leave the comforts of their homes and to go to the free, into the freezing cold. And they understood that there was a good chance they would be beaten up by the forces of evil. All for the love of the land of Israel. Let us not forget who are the good and who are the bad here in this story. Before you start speaking positive, positively, about soldiers and about about the police what's called limut schut before keep your mouths closed because there was tremendous amount of sadistic behavior that was taking place Let's not forget the forces of evil with a smile on their face as they beat up kids. Don't tell me that we're fighting the same battle. Us and the forces, the police and the army. Because we're not. It's not the same battle. Yes, you leaders, you rabbis that came against us, that went publicly, viciously, slandered us without being there, without knowing what happened, without explaining who are the bad, who are the bad ones in this story, the ones that came and destroyed beautiful communities. That's letter one. Letter two on the bulletin board in a high school. What is going on? Amona, now Ofra. And it seems like it will continue to go on. How much can we take? What are you doing to the land of Israel? Why can't I grow up? like everybody else. Why can't this be a normal state like other, other states? 
a state which has principles and true leaders with an army that protects its citizens instead of destroying communities. How have we, how have we reached this low level? How have we sunk so deep? It wasn't enough for us 11 years ago, Gush Katif, not enough? We didn't learn any lessons from Gush Katif? Apparently not. Why me, a girl 16 years old? My only dream is to be able to grow up in a positive environment. Why do I have to face time and time again the destruction of one more community and another and another? So you could turn to me and say, well, you got your choice. You have your choice. You don't have to go. Nobody was forcing you. That's true. Nobody Drive forced us to go. Drive safe. No, no. But how could a Jew, how can a Jew turn the other cheek, turn his face, put his head in the sand as if he doesn't see what's happening? How could we be a 15-minute drive away from destruction and not help defend these communities? How can you sit back and not do anything when you see families being destroyed, when you see communities being destroyed? This is not the letter right now, but as we're talking right now, there are families from Mamona that are on their 12th or 13th day of a hunger strike. Who remembers them? That was a long time, it was a month ago. You know, the Jewish memory lasts for a couple of, uh, a couple of minutes maybe, like a fish. Who's, where are the people, where are they today? They're on a hunger strike. Do we think about them? Where are all the yeshivas? There's a famous story about Rav Kahana. We should engrave it on our hearts because it's so true. Rav Kahana was, it was the night of Shabbat, Friday night. And there's a custom in many yeshivot that the students go around in a circle. The rabbis stand and the, and the students of the yeshiva, married students, single students, they go and they shake the faculty of the yeshiva's hands. So Rav Kahana went and made the rounds and one of the rabbis grabbed his hand and did not release it. And he says, he says, Rav Meir, you are killing Soviet Jewry. You are destroying Soviet Jewry. So Rav Kahana didn't want, you know, it's Shabbat, it's other people, did I want to embarrass them? He was trying to move on. Okay, let's just try to ignore that one. But he's holding his hand and not letting him go. So Rav Kahana poses himself and he says, let me tell you something. I've been in the yeshiva many years and I do not remember one fast that was called to save Soviet Jewry. That you would agree with me would definitely not hurt. It could only help. I do not remember in the years that I've been in the yeshiva, I do not remember a prayer, a prayer get-together, gathering, in order to save the Jews in the Soviet Union. I don't remember one. And surely we both agree that those things do not, that those things do not harm. They can only help. And the rabbi let go of Rabbi Kahana's hand as he walked on. How true that is. Not everybody, <clears throat> not everybody is built not everybody is built for these kinds of events. It's not easy. It's not easy to see. We spoke about this in the Amona, about the traumatic experience here that kids go through, what they see, the stories that you've heard 
today and go back to the Amona class. Those are things that stay with you all your life. Those things stay with you. It's not easy. But we still, we don't see in the yeshivas, we don't see them calling for the whole yeshiva to go and fast. If you can't fast, it's hard for you to fast, okay. So fast for, for four hours, you know, a few hours you could fast. It's considered to be a fast, halachically. It's, even if you take a few hours, it's considered to be uh, a fast. We don't do that. We don't do that. Sometimes, maybe, we'll say a token, shira malot, which takes about a minute or two. I mean, at least it's something, not much, but at least it's something. So there's so much that we could do, Torah-wise. Maybe we could learn 24-7. We could get groups of people to learn, make sure that there's not a moment that we're not learning. To try the merits of learning Torah should, should help. Everybody could help. If you're not there to fight, there's many, many things that can be done to help. We're not there. Unfortunately, we're not there. We're not participants in the, in the sorrow and the misery that these people... And I was thinking about it. A month ago, there were 42 families. Two weeks ago, in Ofra, there's another nine. There's 51. I hate to say it, but that number has been sticking. It's been on my mind. We know that there are 50 levels of knowledge 50 levels of purity and we know on the opposite side of the coin there are 50 levels of impurity there's something that's ringing in my ears that when you put the number of houses together families that were destroyed we come up to 51 we've passed the gate we've passed that 50th gate of impurity She goes on and listen closely, this 16 year old girl. Many of my friends said, we have tests. We have tests coming up. You're not going to be ready for these tests. How can you sit for a test when families, when the, when the land of Israel is being destroyed? When people are yelling and crying, how can you sit? on the sidelines. Don't say, don't say you understand me. My teachers do not come up to me and tell me, oh I understand, would you like to speak to, would you like to talk about it, get it off your chest. Do not come up to me teachers. Where were you? Listen to this, 16 year old. She's asking correctly, where are the teachers? What are you teaching us? Is this something theoretic? Is this something space? Is this like Torah? You know, in space. You know, we have computers that could teach us Torah. We don't need rabbis. We don't need Rebetzins either. Where are the examples? I must point out that I know that there where my daughter learns in Malele Vona, I must say that I almost always meet the head rabbi of the high school in Malele Vona. His name is, is Rav Gadi. Remember the name, Rav Gadi Zimra. And he's approximately my age, and I've seen him throughout the years, over and over again, with the youth, of course, he's with, uh, he's with the men when this happens, not with the girls, but he's there. But how about the other teachers? So don't come up to me and say, we understand and we're with you. You were not with us. You stayed back. You did not come to join us. So don't come up to us later on. We don't want to hear you. This is terrible. What kind of, if a teacher is not an example, a living example of what Torah is, not words, not, not theory. There's plenty of people shooting that off. But no, she says, listen to this. Next time you could, you could do tshuva, you could repent. Next time come and be with us.
and you may continue to threaten to throw us out of school, but we will continue to go. Imagine that. Not only are the teachers not helping, but they're threatening these girls that if they go to try to, to, try to stop the, the demolition here, that they're going to th be thrown out of school. We are the next generation. I think that you could be proud of us. I could just give you one promise, that when we grow up and when we're older, there will be no more demolitions, there will be no more destruction of settlements of the land of Israel. We will not allow this to continue. That I guarantee you. From these rocks, from these buildings that were destroyed, we will use these rocks to build the third temple. Two letters. Amen. Few more things before we conclude here. There's a song, I don't know who came up, maybe it was the Secret Service came up with the song, somebody from the inside, but there's this terrible song, and I'm going to have to sing it, even though I don't want to, but so you understand the song and the I, message to the song. Are you going to dance it too? <laughs> what? Are you going to dance No, I'm going to without the dancing here. Okay? This uh, song was created 11 years ago in Gush Katif by the ultra-loyalists of the state. The state worshippers. What was the message? Listen to this song. Am Hanetzach lo mefached, lo mefached midirech aruka. Am Hanetzach lo mefached, lo mefached midirech aruka. Translated. A, a nation, the eternal nation of Israel, is not afraid to continue in its long path of history. We're not afraid to continue the long path of history. Let's just keep it rolling here. Let's keep these tragedies. We'll just, you know, take one more, give us, dish it out, we'll take another tragedy. This song in Gush Katif, I couldn't take it, can't even stand it. And it was back. I didn't hear it in Amona, not once. But I did hear it many times in Ofra. Like hundreds singing it. This is unbelievable. What kind of statement is that? What kind of... That's Judaism, that's Torah outlook. Let's talk about a few things here. It says the following. It says in the tractate of... Nidarim, 20, page 22, second side, says an amazing, amazing thing. If the Jewish people would not have sinned at, during the sin of the calf, which happens to be this week's portion, if the Jewish people would not have sinned, participated in the sin of the golden calf, then we would have had, uh, we would have had five books of Moses, and the book of Joshua. Um, and the final redemption would have came. So today we have 24 or 26 books of the Bible. Depending which, how you count them. And you know, and we have 65 or 63 tractates depending how you count them. So in the original plan of God, it was supposed to be that we were only going to have the five books of Moses and we were going to come into the land of Israel. The land of Israel would be conquered. The book of Joshua speaks about the uh, settling the tribes, excuse me, settling the tribes in the land of Israel and the borders of the land of Israel. And that's it. History is over. But it didn't come to, into fruition. Why? Because we made a sin. Were they singing there? Were they singing there? We're not afraid for the long journey? 
Look what you've caused. Tragedies, calamities, holocausts because of this, because of our sins. And that's number one. Number two, it says in the tractate of Eruvin on page 54, side one, it says that if not for the sin of the golden calf, we would have had only the first tablets, the, the first tablets that Moshe, not tablets that, you know, if you're not feeling well, you know, call me in the morning, but the, the, the commandments, the, which, were on, which were on two tablets. So we, if we would have had, okay, if we would not have sinned at this time in the desert with the golden calf, we would have retained the first tablets. We would have had the entire Torah on those first tablets. As we said, five books of Moses and Joshua. And no nation would be successful in fighting against us or damaging or hurting us. An amazing thing. There would have been no reason for the Jewish people to need any weapons, any army to go into the land of Israel. The only reason why we had to fight in the land of Israel in the time of Joshua and the only reason why we needed weapons was because of the fact that we messed up. So because of that, then we messed up, so we lost. How many Jews have we lost? Because in our fights, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, even when we win. Okay, we lose a lot of our, our great people. They have families, they have friends, lives are destroyed, families are destroyed. And you, the goal, the song, we have, you know, we're not afraid of the long haul. Yeah. And, it, and it, we keep on going. Tractate of Sanhedrin on the 98th page, second side, says the following. We say it every day in the morning prayers. Adi Avor Abcha Hashem. We say this. If you look in, if you look in Az Yashir, when the Jewish people crossed over the river, the Nile, when they crossed over and the Egyptians drowned on the seventh day of Passover. If you look, it's very interesting because it's not just talking about what happened to the Egyptians. It's talking about coming and building the temple. It's talking about God will be one. What in the world is going on here? Let's just keep to the subject, yeah? Keep to the subject of the Egyptians drowning in the Nile and the Jewish people, you know, surviving. No, because the grand plan, folks, was that the Jewish people were supposed to walk into the land of Israel, cross over the, uh, the Nile and walk into the land of Israel, not 40 years later, but 11 days later, we were supposed to walk in there and we were supposed to build uh, the first temple and that temple would have stayed for eternity. And because of the fact that we messed up, because of the fact that we messed up, that's not the way it played out. But here it says even more so, listen to this, it says even more that Hashem was willing to bring tremendous miracles in the time of the rebuilding of the second temple, in the time when Ezra went up with only 42,000 Jews from Babylonia, after seven years of being exiled in Babylonia, Ezra and Nehemiah go up with 42,000 people. The majority of the Jewish people stayed back in Babylonia. So Hashem was willing Hashem was willing to bring tremendous miracles like He did in the time of Joshua or according to some opinion, like He did in the time of Moses in Egypt. Tremendous miracles and we could have gone up to the land of Israel without the permission of the king, Cyprus. We could have gone without permission. But it didn't work out that way. Why? Because of our sins. Now, the Talmud right here doesn't say the sin. It just says that that's the way it was supposed to go down. We should have, came, we should have had the final chapter of history during the time where Ezra and Nehemiah come up to the land of Israel after the story of Purim. It should have been a finale. The curtain should have came down on the Jewish history. But it did not. So what was the sin? What was the sin? According to most opinion, the sin was that they married, they intermarried. In the time of the, in the, time of the uh, pre, before the building of the second temple, the, the problem of the Jewish people, that they were intermarried with the, uh, 
with the Gentiles, the surrounding nations that were around them. So because of the fact that we had this sin. So once again, listen. Because of the fact that we sinned with the golden calf, so the history in, in those days could have came to a close. No, but maybe also then they were singing that same stupid song that we're not afraid of the long haul. Think about the tragedies, the Holocaust, the, 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 the just the calamities that have happened to the Jewish people, millions or billions of people no longer with us, and you're singing that song. This is brought down in uh, Rav Sadok, if you look up in Divrei Sofrim, uh, chapter 33, this is brought down also in the Meshech Chochmah, in his book on uh, Exodus chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 22, he brings down he brings down the same uh, same sin that uh, that we're talking about that the Jewish people were not redeemed. They should have been redeemed. The final redemption should have came some two thousand years ago in the time of Babylonia, that, and and it did not. And <clears throat> the last point here is that the Chatam Sofer writes in one of his talks, one of his Torah talks on Purim. It was the year. Um, it was the year uh, 5580, 5580, so approximately 200 years ago. Listen to this closely. He writes there that 